Hi, my name is Dylan Archbold, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Atheist. So tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would please, who you are, what you believe, and why. Sure. My name is Dylan Archbold. I'm 31 years old. I'm originally from Alaska, but I currently reside in Vermont. I'm currently an atheist, but I was for the majority of my life a Catholic. And it was only at about age 19 to about a two-year process to actually feel comfortable calling myself an atheist. My father was very Catholic, and my mother, her entire side of the family, they're not atheists. They're just sort of apathetic about the entire concept of religion. It's not something that's very important to them. So, I, you know, I call them apathists, really, which is actually a real term, but they're not actually that. So my father was really responsible for my religious education growing up. You know, I was uh, baptized, First Communion, Confession, the whole nine yards. And my the responsible for my actually like religious education was my grandparents' best friend, Father Alfredo. So for the majority of my life, it was just a fact that there was a God and that the one true church was the Catholic church. Just, these were facts that were unquestionable, but it wasn't until about age 14 that I found the sort of rote answers that I'd been raised with to be unsatisfying. So I really got into religious study on my own. And that's when I started doing reading from early church fathers, very uh, prominent religious figures historically. And that really got me into a much more secure, much more fervent Catholic stance. For the next couple of years, I was very into having religious debates with people, really proclaiming my convictions. And it wasn't until, like I said, about age 19 that I ran into my, my first hurdle, as it were. Because, I mean, I, I, was, I was so positive, I was so sure in my epistemology that, you know, God was so obvious, you might as well ask if I existed. But one thing I really enjoy is, is debate. So back in the day, I used to watch videos with prominent atheists uh, that would argue with apologists like William Lane Craig or Frank Turek or John Lennox. And I was always, I always went into that just assuming that the that the atheists who are of course unreasonable were going to get trounced by the the unassailable logic of the religious minded. But I found almost every single time very disappointed in the apologists. Like, wow, that was actually that that logical track doesn't really hold if I if I think about it. And these atheists are making some good points, and that that sort of began my my first seeds of doubt and then i started really educating myself into the the process of logic and the 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 schools and the the history of that because I've, I've always been a big fan of history but there's only so much you can cover with your own private studies and i i eventually it took a couple, a couple of years as i said but i eventually walked away realizing that the most base philosophical ideas the the epistemology the the, the presuppositions that people hold were not sound when it came to religion. And since I value truth more than comfort, I, I had to realize that at that point, my, my reasons for still being faithful were mostly emotional. And as I said, I don't find any value in that. So I, I had to walk away and was, was no longer convinced that there actually was a or any gods. And that was after a, a very extensive religious re-education, if you will. I mean, I, I threw myself into reading the Bible again. I've written it cover to cover twice in my life, once as a theist and once as an atheist. And I read all sorts of, I mean, I read the Quran, I've read the Book of Mormon, ugh, I've read Dianetics, I've read part of the Vedas, I haven't finished that. I, I don't claim to have read that very thoroughly. Um, but yeah, so, so after a very intense study and studying the history of the churches and logic, systems and philosophy. I, I, I was just no longer convinced that there was any sound reason to be a theist, and that's why I'm, I am a theist. I'm no longer convinced that there is a singular or any god yeah. or, or supernatural forces at all. What about um, your sort of coming out? Did it, Was it difficult telling your dad or um, probably your mother wasn't so hard, but can you just talk about how you navigated that? Sure. It, it just it wasn't... Um, I didn't make a big deal out about it. I mean, they... They, my parents are great, wonderful people. They're, they're old hippies. Um, so they're pretty chill about most things. Um, 
I mean, like my dad, despite being a turbo Catholic, as I call him, he's an old deadhead. He just like he's he wears a tie dye shirt still and bandanas and he looks like a Puerto Rican Frank Zappa. I mean, that's that's what he looks like. Um, so actually, I mean, it, it wasn't something like I con- confronted and sat them down with. It was just I no longer, you know, hung a cross above my bed. I no longer went to go pray. I it basically my, my behavior changed and. Well, you know, when it came up in casual conversation, I was like, yeah, I'm just an atheist because I don't enjoy drama in my life. I don't, you know, I have enough of it on without me adding to it. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't anything to write home about in the TV movie of my life. This won't be a big dramatic scene for someone to chew the scenery. <laughs> Who's the leading uh, role played by? That's the question. Oh, for, uh, that plays me. Oh, clearly a C- Chris Himesworth. I mean, no, who else could... You know, rival the majesty that is my visage. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a significant other in your life? I do. I, I've been married for about three or four years now, um, but we were together for about 10 years prior to that uh, before we eventually got hitched. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about how your worldviews work together or maybe if they don't work together, just sort of the, how does that part of your relationship go generally? I'm just fine. Actually, she she's also an atheist, but that wasn't really, it was never really an issue in our relationship because we've known each other since early teenagehood pretty much, but we didn't start a relationship until many years later. So I always knew what her religious convictions were. Um, and it wasn't really an issue. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I'm ashamed at this point in my life to admit that there were many years in my later teen years where I was like, you know, I just want you to believe in something. Come on, you know, I, I, I want to call you to Christ, that sort of thing. And, you know, bless her heart. She, I can't believe she put up with that nonsense, but I'm, I'm sure it's it's been great ever since I've, I've dropped that aspect of my personality. She wasn't raised religious? No, but not, not, again, not a dedicated atheist household. Just, I mean, she's been a, uh, culturally Christian, you know, that sort of vague, non-denominational, that everyone seems to be in the United States. Okay. Let's talk about some of the sort of uh, areas philosophically where we differ. Maybe we can go straight to metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, whatever interests you. Let's talk about it. Okay. Uh, When I was a believer, the arguments that convinced me that were compelling to me were the cosmological argument and the moral argument. Those are the two big ones for me, and I think for a lot of people. But in my subsequent watching, as I said, of of YouTube debates, I found that, honestly, a lot of the base level epistemological claims of, of not just Catholicism, but all of religion, are not based on any actual observable or verifiable phenomena. They just seem to be baseless assertions, and that's not me being confrontational or accusing anyone of anything. It's just what I've been able to discern. It just seems to be that here's the claim because, and there's nothing really to justify it. And I I find that, you know, most people, and I I would almost be willing to claim all people live their lives through inference and induction from the base level of once you get past hard solipsism, that's how we basically observe our surroundings and build models of our reality. And there's nothing like that to be found in religion. There's nothing I can be like, this is a fact and I am not being misled by my flawed senses or I'm not being misled by a hallucination or drugs or I mean, there's nothing I can, there's no consensus I can draw from other people. There's no verification process. There's no way to find an accurate model that would actually map to religious foundations. So I find them to be invalid. Mm. So, um, what about Pinocchio? Do you like the story of Pinocchio? Have you read it? Are you familiar with the basic idea? <laughs> I've only seen the Disney version, and that was when I was a child. I haven't watched it in years. Okay. Um, you know, the little wooden doll wants to be a real boy. And I think that if you found out that you were programmed to think, say, and do everything that you think, say, and do, you would want to be a real boy. <laughs> you really would. <laughs> Well, that may be the case. Um, but as I said, I, I value truth more than comfort. And it's, if it turns out that we are all just meat robots, if it does turn out that all of our emotions and experiences are just electrochemical c- configurations of the brain, if it does turn out that death is all there is, it just the lights turn out, 
oh well i mean it's <laughs> maybe an unpleasant thought but i you know oh well what about the credible tales from 2000 years of the saints which are replete with stories of the afterlife both heaven and hell and even stories of purgatory i mean i think it's a bit naive to dismiss all of the hundreds and maybe thousands of stories about the afterlife and real concrete experiences that people have had where they've been warned by a brother that died right in the middle of the funeral it's like stop praying for me your prayers are doing me no good i'm in hell i can't be saved and there are lots of warnings like this how do you account for that i, I don't have to <laughs> it's very simple actually I, it doesn't actually, it's actually kind of funny. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. If there's no way to investigate and verify, the null hypothesis is that you just withhold judgment until such time as you can, or you just never do. I mean, I, I no more believe these Catholic saint stories than I do the, the, the heroic attributes that are down in the sagas of the Norse, nor do I believe the legends of the many... American Indian tribes or the, you know, the African bush gods and whatever you want to say. I mean, these are all varying competing stories. I mean, not just, not just the supernatural ones either. I'm not even restricting it just to that realm. I mean, the, I don't think there's enough evidence to conclude that people's accounts of say alien abductions are correct or Bigfoot or the men in black style dimension hopper things, the chupacabra or the Jersey devil. These are just things that, do not have enough evidentiary or logical support in order to verify their existence. And until that time comes, you either withhold judgment or you find evidence to discount those. And I'm actually currently, even though I'm an atheist, I mean, I, I'm actually quite convinced that several specific gods, it's not that I just don't believe in them. I'm convinced that several of them actually do not in fact exist, which is that more hardline atheism, but not for, I'm not prepared to, going to every specific one on the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what my definition of God is, right? He's the first cause, the uncaused cause, the only necessary being. And there can't be two because God is infinite in every perfection. So if there's another candidate, we just need to compare. And if they differ, then the candidate is not God. And if they don't differ, then they're not two, but one. And my leap of faith is that I'm not God, that God is God. But people in the East tend to go the other way and they say that separation is illusion the other is illusion and some go so far as to say that the material world is illusion maya and all these sorts of things there's a great swath of philosophies and religions that have this sort of solipsistic tinge to them so can you just talk a little bit about the east and about monism about hard solipsism just sort of compare and contrast that with your own perspective on the material world and the other and, and the very fact of your own existence. People think that it most, most of these things are, are, are Eastern, but there's actually quite a lot, a long tradition in, in Western philosophy that tackles this subject. But the, the, the problem of solipsism, the, the beyond me, the, the I, that, that problem, the everything external to me, that problem is as far as I can tell, unsolvable. And as such, most of these exercises seem to be relatively unfounded as far as I've been able to ascertain. The often examples that people go to, you know, the dream of Brahma, the, the matrix, the, all of that good stuff, the, the brain in of that, the, the piece of the, of the God, the whole, um, Oh, what's that term? Uh, Kabbalah? No, the, the, we're all part of the trees and the rocks and everything. Pantheism. Panthe yes. Thank you. Pantheism. All of those things seem to propose basically that experience is illusory, and that may be the case. I, I fully admit that I could be a brain in a, in a jar or just a piece of a, a larger divine, but I, I don't seem to be experiencing that. And until someone shows me a way that out of my experience, as, as though I could not be and not take in the information that seems to be completely involuntary, I don't seem to have any way of controlling what I, the, my sort of my linear experiences and my, my sensory experiences and memory, I don't seem to ha have any way of controlling or getting out of this reality, if you want to put it that way. And until someone shows me a way to do so, or until someone shows me that e the idea of an external outside reality or, or partial reality or whatever model you propose 
And Solomon shows, shows me a way to do that, or even that there's an indication that such a thing is even real and not just a, an interesting thought experiment. It's ultimately philosophy. It seems to be sort of an interesting thought, but ultimately sort of meaningless. <laughs> So um, the reason I brought up that sort of branch of philosophy and that whole category of worldviews, which I sort of classify as solipsism or pantheism or monism, whatever word you want to use, to me, it's all the same thing. There's only God. But to contrast with that is another possibility that God is God. There are mainline forms of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which are strictly speaking classically theist, meaning monotheistic. And um, can you talk just a little bit about what you think characterizes that particular collection of worldviews, which is typically referred to as monotheism? Right, aside from the fact that they're all, all worshiping the same God and from the same traditions? Yeah, just what's your impression? I just want to know what your impression is. Do these have a privileged place for you? They certainly have a privileged place for me. They are the first class. I have three classes of religion. The first class is monotheism, which has God and heaven and hell. My second class is those that only have God and heaven. And my third class is for people that believe that we're destined for complete annihilation. And there's absolutely no trace of anything ever having happened ever. That's what I classify as nihilism, and there, most atheists fall into that category. So I just want to explore this first class with you, the monotheistic class, uh, where there's a heaven and a hell. Well, I, I've joked in the past, and I don't know if this is sort of the answer that you're looking for, but I, if I was to, I, I can't force myself to believe. It, I don't seem to have that ability. No, I, that's why I'm here. But if I, if I had to choose a faith. I actually find a lot of the pagan faiths are actually rather interesting. I find some of their interesting ideas rather compelling. Uh, but yeah, if I if I had a choice, I guess I'd, I'd go th it's sort of that direction. But I I can't find them all equally the the supernatural in general uh, just rather unconvincing at this point in my life. When I talk to atheists about the afterlife, they just seem really reluctant to engage in a thought experiment about the pleasantness of heaven. I don't think I could be happy in a place like heaven, even as it's described, because there are activities that I enjoy that bring me intense joy and happiness. That uh, if you go feel a red looking at the Bible, probably aren't going to be in heaven, and that just sucks. That's just unfortunate. <laughs> so. No, 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 no. Everything you enjoy here, uh, there'll be something comparable or something way better in heaven. So, like sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever you like. It's all there. It's all the good stuff's in heaven, all the bad stuff's in hell. But uh, this brings me to my next topic, which is sexuality, sexual morality, and what's taboo? What is still taboo for you, and why? Why are there any taboos whatsoever? Is it only to do with the possibility of having a deformed baby? Let me just start by saying, if you haven't tried sex, I'd give it a shot if I were you. Masturbation, close second. Group sex with anonymous partners, just, just tops. Oh, boy, it's like... Because it's just way, way better than all of that. So if you get the chance, I try it as long as it's consensual. Um, <laughs> honestly, I'm pretty uh, – people would consider me very liberated in, in, in that regard. I'm pretty much whatever makes consenting adults happy, even things that personally squick me out, even things that I initially recoil at. I mean, hey, man, if that's – if that actually giving you pleasure and you're not really getting hurt, I mean – more power to you, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you can do anything that you want. You can enjoy everything and anything as long as you're not sinning, meaning that you're not hurting yourself, you're not hurting others. But there is a thought experiment I'd like to try on you, if you don't mind, that has to do with the sort of sexual morality. Uh, do you have any young people that you care about, like a niece, a nephew, a son of your own, a daughter of your own? I don't have any children, but yes, I do have young people in my life that I care about intensely. Uh, three kids that are very young and two brothers and a sister and we take care of them okay. sometimes so listen these three cute little kids i'm just going to ask you to picture a scenario where some really nasty people have a sexual fetish where they like to have dolls they're not real humans they're dolls but they look exactly like these three cute kids that you love and they have these dolls they are so realistic and they're animatronic that means they can move around and they're doing all sorts of gross stuff to them sexually and torturing them and killing them eventually and they're filming it all and they're sharing it amongst their friends that are all into this do you think they've crossed a line or is it all good because it's among consenting adults and no one's getting hurt 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I just because I would be personally repulsed by it doesn't actually mean I think they're actually crossing any moral lines. I mean, and if it turned out that these were the caretakers and guardians and uh, like the teachers and uh, priests and everyone that your three innocent children were constantly being around and that there were weekends away with these kids and with these creepy people, that wouldn't bother you? Hey, Amen. As long as they're keeping it to the robots. I mean, they, they, they find that at least all the research that I've seen, actually, the, the more pornography, the more prostitution, the more degrading and seedy sexual things in society. I mean, I've, I've seen a ton of studies that say the more of that there is in a society, the actual lower the rates of sexual assault and pedophilia or well, you know, sexual assault, pedophilia. And I meaning like in my eyes, even a pedophile, which society deems to be like the worst of the worst of the worst. Is if they've never acted on that, if they've never hurt a child, they should, I mean, go nuts. They haven't actually done anything. I don't believe in punishing people before a crime. Oh, okay. I mean, obviously, as a as an adult with children that I care about, if I if they were very open about that, they're like, hey, I have these thoughts, and I'd always keep a wary eye on them. But I'm not gonna. I don't believe in punishing people before a crime. Uh, I don't believe in thought crime either. The thoughts are thoughts. And so a lot of them are involuntary. People don't choose these things. So I, I, it, would, it would be hypocritical of me to punish someone else for having thoughts when I'm sure I've had thoughts that would disgust other people. I'm sure I've had thoughts that would rival your own. Even to this day, it's not like my conversion has cleansed my mind of all the evil thoughts that come into my mind. You know, I'm still a sick person. It just so happens that I've put my trust in the doctor and I've signed up for the surgery, right? But um, I want to talk a little bit about paganism and some of your fantasies about what this weekend would be like, this pagan weekend. Uh, just paint me a little picture of what attracts you about paganism and what you think you might be able to get out of it if you were to get involved. Well, I actually find some of their moral systems to be truly intriguing. So, for instance, in, in monotheistic religions, it's sort of a divine command theory where the commandments come from on high. It's black and white. It's sort of a checklist. But in a lot of paganism, there's not that sort of system. In fact, I mean, they sort of the, I know it's not, they, they like to claim that's the case, but it actually isn't that uh, uh, witch, uh, Wiccanism, uh, that sort of everything comes back to you threefold. I find that interesting. It's almost related to karma in that regard. I find karma interesting, not the watered down American colloquial karma that people talk about, but the actual karmic system that, that the, the wages of, your action change who you are as a fundamental person in the next life, which is similar to sin in that regard, except they just don't, don't see it as a transgression. It's just sort of a fact. It's sort of an amoral fact. I find that interesting. And the religious system that I find the most fascinating is sort of the, the heathenry, the, 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 nor the Germanic neo-paganism, the Thor and, and Odin and Tyr and Frey and all those, actually that, that system is I just think those stories are cool. I mean, just fighting giants and it's just fun. But sort of their moral system was much more pragmatic and sort of by our standards, it would be cold. But I find the whole, uh, the inborn loyalty and the sort of, well, you do what you do when you have to do it. That's a very interesting idea to me. They're much more flexible and much more uh, situational. And I, I kind of find those that, that interesting as opposed to the rigid hierarchical, uh, yes, no, kind of bad. I mean, I grew up with it for 20 years. Now I'm looking at other stuff. The grass is always greener sort of thing. For you sure, know what I mean? For sure, for sure. So at the end of my episodes, as you may know, I do ask my guests to give the closing thought, just something nice and positive for the listener that's out there. You don't know who's listening, but uh, just to wrap up, what do you think you might be able to say? Sure. I mean, I have some positive thoughts I always like to leave with people and that's to anyone listening who, who's perhaps depressed or, or struggling with thoughts of problems of that nature, uh, please seek psychiatric help. That's always, uh, it may not seem it at the time. And I've, you know, I've been in those bleak situations before, but they actually help is out there for you if you need it. And just because you don't have an external force in your life that's looking out for you doesn't mean that other people aren't looking out for you. And if you feel that you don't have people in your life right now and you need someone else that you would have cer certainly find in faith, there are people out there that can help you. Um, there's many organizations that can. And if you ever find yourself, you know, walking a lonely road, just because you find yourself alone doesn't mean that you can't find 
others that are also walking that path that can then bring you into the group. So everyone can find someone else out there and we can all be good, happy, sunshine friends together. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.